Hey everybody, welcome to the WebDM live stream here on Wednesday. Uh, we are going through part three of uh, Mordenkainen Presents Monsters of the Multiverse. We're actually going to get to the monsters today, <laughs> which is like 90% of the book. Um, uh, not going to go through them all, but we're going to talk about some of the big changes uh, and the like uh, while we're here and maybe uh, take some uh, chat favorites to uh, to dive into with the monsters, depending on how how uh, frisky I'm feeling later in the hour, but uh, <laughs> I hope everybody is having a good week and is uh, is, is playing some good D and D. Um, my uh, my open table D and D game is going on strong, and uh, just finished third session uh, this last week, and I'm having a blast. It's good to get back running some fifth edition, especially here at the tail end of the edition, uh, to to see it what it was like uh, on its <laughs> on its final uh, final years before the change off uh, in 2024. So yeah, um, I believe we're seeing some of those sneak peeks in uh, Monsters of the Multiverse, uh, of course. So we'll talk about some of those changes and the like uh, here uh, later on. But, um, you know, if you're interested in hearing more of what we like to talk about and more of Dungeons and Dragons, role-playing games, uh, just BS RPG theory uh, and the like, <laughs> you can head on over to our Patreon and uh, check us out over there. We've got a weekly podcast and more. Uh, so why don't you go and get yourself some more WebDM uh, over there at our Patreon. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think it's time as I like to say, uh, to dive right into this, because I, I really like this uh, book overall. I'm just gonna say that, like my, my general impression of it is pretty positive, uh, especially uh, with the monsters. Um, by way of a bit of, of confession, uh, you know, monsters and, and the running of like a satisfying set piece combat uh, or, or with like a complicated monster, it's kind of one of my weak spots as a GM. It's one of those areas that I'm always wanting to improve in to, to make sure that I'm, I'm doing my best and am able to deliver the same kind of experience uh, for that portion of the game as I do for other portions of the game, which I think really excel, more exploration, open-ended uh, parts of Dungeons and & Dragons. And so for me, like complicated monsters with big spell lists and all sorts of different attacks that do two or three different things and lots of options you know if it takes more than a page or even just a full page it's a little bit too much for me uh, because in that moment of running uh, combat i'm dealing with a lot of other things I've got the initiative going I'm processing and listening to what you know who knows how many players uh, I've got are, are, are telling me they want to do on their turn having to remember all of the conditions of the fight what's going on in various parts of the battlefield and even if I'm using a VTT or a battle map or, or theater of the mind I find that the cognitive load is, uh, is is largely the same and I really have to set up tools for myself break down a monster select attack routines you know rewrite a spell in as few words as possible uh, in order to get an experience uh, for the players and myself of combat as exciting, visceral, tense, too often <laughs> I'll be in a campaign and it'll get to a climactic battle and my legendary custom homebrew monster, I'll just forget to take a turn, you know, especially if there's legendary actions involved. Uh, and I'm, I'm like, you know, reacting and legendary acting and all these things. And it's my turn, top of the initiative, go, wait a minute. It's wait, wait a minute. <laughs> when did my monsters get to act? Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think that uh, simplifying monsters, the goal of making them more accessible uh, is, is a noble goal. And I, I uh, support that goal. I, I'm not sure that all of the monsters in, in uh, Monsters of the Multiverse uh, achieve that or beat that. But I think overall, I, I really like what I see. And the things that I don't like are easily changed. And I, I know for a lot of a lot of players and a lot of GMs, like having to make adjustments, make changes to say, like, well, actually, you know, this isn't written in their stat block, but yeah, they can do that. Like, take the Leviathan, for example. Just reading through it, right? This is one of those monsters that just seemed like a paper tiger when it first came out. And I think it's pretty beefy now, the, the fact that they can use their big attack over the entire area in one, one round instead of five. I it's pretty beefy. Like, they're a really cool showcase monster. Um, but apparently they need to breathe water or breathe air. They can't actually breathe. 
<laughs> underwater despite being a water elemental and that's just like a reduction of the the, the flavor text in uh, the you know that precedes the stat block and then not having like an unusual nature elemental body or something like that as a trait because of an overall reduction of traits in order to make the stat box cleaner and simpler so I, like i can see some dms being like well this is ridiculous <laughs> like of course it doesn't need to, to breathe air of course it doesn't need to eat the picture shows it as a giant serpent made of water right it's clearly a magical creature that doesn't need those things and there's plenty of groups out there where the fact that it's not written down makes the a world of difference and something written down in the rule book being part of the official lore part of the official stat block makes it real you know like i for instance i take ghouls in the monster manual art don't have that undead nature trait like to me ghouls need to sleep they need to dream that's how orcas gets to them <laughs> you know uh things like that I, I i to me those those differences um can sometimes make for like an interesting hook for a monster other times for like the leviathan it's like well, this is obvious it, it should be here the same thing like vecna vecna has whatever spells i want him to have it doesn't matter i don't need a justification i'm a dm but i can see being sore uh, about it uh, Vegna doesn't make an appearance in the book, by the way, but uh, it had made an appearance elsewhere on the internet uh, these last few weeks with his hand and eye intact. Scandalous. How dare he show his two-eyed face in public, that Vecna. <laughs> Not after what he did to those kids. All right. <clears throat> so... <laughs> Yes, uh, we will be taking questions uh, the like. Of course, if you want to uh, ask a question, be sure to proceed that question with a giant uh, question in all caps, uh, or at the very least, a capitalized question. That's the word question, uh, not, the, and not the actual question itself. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we should also uh, maybe take some uh, favorites for which monsters to go over and chat. But um, for now, I want to go and just sort of walk through the bestiary section of, of Monsters of the Multiverse, especially the preamble to it, because it's in the, the preamble where it's like, hey, go read the monster manual for how, what these stat blocks mean, um, that they introduce some of the, few, the changes that they're making here, um, where they're saying like, hey, you know, we're, we are, <laughs> you, you can expect to see weapons and spells work differently here. And I think between that and the and the, the fact that they changed some of the creature types, so like uh, the hobgoblins are fey now. You know, most of the goblinoids uh, end up being fey, and you know, some monsters went from undead to fiend or fiend to undead. Um, it interacts oddly <laughs> with the uh, with the PC uh, fantastical race options in the same way that's like yeah, if you take a weapon from an abishai, it's not going to deal force damage for you, but it does for them. Uh, or they're you know the the spells work differently for monsters like they don't have spell slots they can just cast these spells they have spell like abilities essentially that's that's what these were called in third edition and um you know they it, it doesn't work the same way that spell casting works for pcs so i personally don't mind like there's obviously more than one way to cast a spell in D, &D. Uh, for the simplicity of the dm uh, presenting it like this is fine for me i'm i always have the option to, to like break that down and say like well this is you know how many spells they would have or what slot it is or whatever i can always say like well they cast all their slots at the highest level like a warlock does do whatever i want i can make a custom spell list for the monsters which I would have liked to have seen more of uh, in these but, you know for some people they like the old way of doing it um i i've never really cared for statting them out as a pc spellcaster uh, i haven't in any edition of dungeons and dragons as monsters cast the spells I want them to as often as like seem it seems appropriate, usually one to three times. And so these changes were just like how I've been rendering all the spell casting monsters uh, for for myself for years. Uh, it's sort of nice to see uh, even if the spell selection <laughs> is to be desired. Um, and, you know, but it, this is just one of those things where it's like if you want the full spell casting trait, the removal of them is you know, it's, you're just not going to, it's not going to sit well with you. Um, and I, I appreciate that. Some people like having that. It, 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 it works for them. Um, more power to you to add it back in. It sucks that they took away something you liked. Um, so yeah, that's how I feel about spellcasting. The weapon stuff I think is, is ridiculous. 
<laughs> was the magic weapons trait that hard to remember? Like, I get why it was there, because there's some monsters that couldn't, like, <laughs> they couldn't hurt their enemies. Uh, it might be lycanthropes in the monster manual. I don't have one handy or, or clickable uh, at the moment, but uh, something like that, where, where it's like, okay, yeah, these monsters can't hurt each other or their traditional enemies. So we have to make sure they have some means of doing that. Their weapons are inherently magical, uh, is, is just a, a clean way of doing that, or their weapons overcome some kind of resistance, whatever. Uh, it's simple, it's, it's, it's clean, it's one sentence. Did no idea why all of the monsters actual weapons and natural weapons needed to suddenly change to force damage and i'd be mad if i love well actually i do love playing barbarians i'm kind of mad <laughs> barbarians are one of my favorite classes and my my thing with barbarians is like bear totem is the most boring barbarian i'm sorry it's just like the, it's a it's completely passive yeah i just don't take as much damage like it does the most barbarian thing and that lets him be a damage soak uh, and, and contribute a greater pool of hit points to the party HP pool. But like, if I was any other barbarian, you know, the interesting ones, uh, I would be mad. <laughs> it's a good thing I played them all. I got it all out of my system before this change. <laughs> I just, I don't understand. Or, or even just like, if you wanted to get rid of the trait, why not just introduce something called magical slashing damage or magical bludgeoning damage? Or magical piercing damage and that that's just to me it, it doesn't need the explanation the it, you know just write it in the weapon attack itself it's magical slashing oh so it's not non-magical then which is what's important I, I, to me that's even simpler but i i don't um <clears throat> force damage i this is really this is where my my like the, the lore of the play of the books matter there's there's lore in the rules there's world building that goes on on every in every word like force damage is pure magical damage right it, that's that's how it's described as, as when a spell just does damage when it when it just hurts you it's force damage and so to have the 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 weapons just the physical weapons deal a different kind of damage and i do I, like i i be I really, I'm just, I'm baffled. I really am. I know there's a video I could watch about it, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> I've got too much writing to do. <laughs> so anyway, I, that's how I feel about the weapons. Um, yeah, let's take some questions from chat so I, I can I can cool my uh, my rant a bit. Uh, let's see. I don't even know what time it is. Hey, we're doing good. That wasn't as long as I thought. <laughs> All right, just a minute, Jeff. I'll, I'll uh, get to your question. Oh, I'm so glad you're asking about the Arch Druid. I'm about to talk about the Arch Druid. Got pulled up right now. So Jeff asks, if the PCs face an NPC like an Arch Druid, would you let the PCs use the NPC's gear as written? Probably not as written, but I might uh, convert it into some kind of magic item. You know, so it's if you know, they, let's check out the Arch Druid <laughs> right now, because um, I was going to compare, I was going to contrast them to the Deathlocks here in a minute, but yeah, so they've got a, a staff, I guess, that does poisoning damage. It's up to you how you describe it, I guess. There, there's a lot about this, and specifically these these weapons that deal, you know, non weapon damage. You, this is just a mechanic right here, and ultimately, this is why I, I'm not as bothered by some of the changes in it. Uh, as as I might appear to be, but like this is just a mechanic. When it hits, it does some bludgeoning damage and then a boatload of poison damage. Um, hope they're not don't have you know some kind of immunity to it. Um, is that a spell? Is it a function of the staff? Is it a function of the druid themselves? Do you even call this thing a staff? Is that could it be like a they wild shape their hand into a snake for a hot second? You know, like uh, you know, as if they're casting like a natural. Uh, weapon, uh, thank God, I can't trip. My vocabulary almost left me for a second. Uh, you know, so to me, how you describe the the attack, especially one as simple as this, matters. And how, how you describe it, take seriously. So if it is a staff, and the poison damage is a function of that staff or whatever, we'd be talking about any of these um, you know things. But uh, you know, if that's what you've described, then. Yeah, I, I would find some way, and either I'd look at uh, current magic staffs that are more weapon-like, the so staff of striking, staff of withering. There might even be 
a staff that deals poison damage. Like you might be able to with like staff of the 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 viper or something. And you can turn it into a snake, but it might also just deal poison damage on a hit. Um, so you, that's the first thing I would do. And then it's like, yeah, now do all arch druids have one of these? No. And that's what I think reflavoring. And maybe sometimes it's not poison damage. Maybe sometimes it's lightning or fire. <laughs> maybe sometimes it's it's thunder or something. You know, uh, this is just an attack that has an alternate damage rider that it does. And how you describe it and how you change things up about it is entirely within your purview as a DM. And if a player gives you grief about it, <laughs> tell them it's a voluntary game. And <laughs> they can if they're really that, that upset about it then you know they don't have to play but it's it's you have to deliver a fun game for for your players and you you need to, to feel like you have the freedom to uh to do that change things up yeah good question i'm gonna, I'm gonna dive into the large story here in just a minute but after go ahead and see what uh don's got for us <clears throat> so don's asking has the release of Monsters of the Multiverse spurred edits or rewrites, if anything, in the coming weird ways? That's, oh, God, no. <laughs> Rethink stuff, yeah. But not, like even in my other freelance work, I'm, I'm still kind of going with the old model because that's what the, the style guides for those books are going with. Because, you know, when they, we started writing them, um, you know, we didn't know what kind of changes Wizards were going to make. And, change, and, and making big changes like that to monster stat blocks and all this other kind of stuff is... Um, just not not something we're, we're looking to do what we offered in weird wastelands that would be affected by this are essentially alternate versions of the monster manual humanoid casters so it's like arch druid mage or sorry druid priest mage and archmage are we just offer reskins alternate spell lists for them but they're full spell lists they they, they follow the old um uh, standard in that sense um i think that's fine but the only thing I would change uh, is making the spell list more thematic because the basic druid spell list just sucks. <laughs> It'd be nice to grab some sorcerer or uh, <laughs> cleric spells uh, for them. And, you know, we just, but we stuck with the druid and, and picked spells that uh, make them more of a support uh, caster, which fits their role in the weird wastelands. Uh, much better. Uh, and then they're offered a reskin of werebear for the combat. Uh, druid, which, you know, this, this is something I wish they'd done with the arch druid instead of being like, Hey, pick a CR six or less beast from the however many options there are. of <laughs> Like even the handy table they have uh, is, you know, it's like, all right, I, I'll pick from one of these eight, but why not just follow a model of, of say the, the way that subclasses that have summoned beasts have, why not give me, two or three alternate little chunks here instead of making me go through and pick or even just look at a separate thing have it all self-contained in the stat point like this is their tank form it just looks like a is, a is it a lion is it a bear is it a killer whale I don't know. Um, it's only going to be around for three rounds <laughs> don't sweat it uh, and, and then you know one that's like a, the striker you know has a shark or a wolf or something you know a sneaker you know whatever <laughs> and it's just quick changes add they, this many temp hp that they get they get this attack now you know they can't use these features quick changes and then you just describe it differently um I think, you know they get I, the, i'll stick because i'm going to just talk about the arch druid because I'm, I'm on it now um but uh, i'll get to the other questions here in a bit like <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the Arch Druid is, uh, I do not think has benefited as much from the design philosophy that uh, wants to simpl simplify spellcasting and, and like present spellcasting monsters in a way that, that doesn't involve the DM having to navigate through 20 different options of what to do with their spellcasting action with a lot of like trap options. Because there's a lot of the spellcasting uh, or the spell lists for monsters, from just the monster manual that are garbage. <laughs> they're, they're just rewrite them. <laughs> you know, what can we, they have whatever spells you want them to have or, or they need to have for it to be a, a, a fun and engaging fight that fits with the lore of your world. Right. Um, and so I look at the arch druid and, and the things that make them a druid. Right. And they have the druid tag. 
uh, which is not consistently applied because the Bard, a few pages later, does not have the Bard tag, the martial arts adept, uh, and later on doesn't have the monk. I haven't checked all of them, but I just noticed for like that, like Blackguard has Paladin, so they could use a Holy Avenger, I guess, <laughs> or something. Uh, but then it, some of the others uh, say don't, but they said they're Druid, so, you know, but they don't feel like a Druid. Like my, you know, they, they've got some things that, that a Druid can do. They've got an interesting attack, which is what I like. I like the fact that their attacks are different. Like we talked about the staff, it's, you can reskin it, all different kinds of things. Wildfire, man, this is a strong attack here. I love this one. It's pretty good. 66 plus five fire damage. And the target is blinded until the start of the Druid's next turn. It's just period. Deal with it. You just could toss three of those. So like, I like that as a power. But I'm sympathetic to the, to, to the view that says like, okay, well, the DM has described this NPC as a Druid. We kind of know what Druids are up to, what they can do. Yeah, not every PC and monster needs to work exactly the same. I, I don't think that's the case. I wasn't doing that in third edition when the, the rules told me to. But there is an expectation. I think it's important to uphold that, that expectation. And like, if, if the, my Druid, after fighting one of these Archdruid goes, how do I get some of that wildfire? Then I'm going to turn that into a spell that that PC can learn. And like, they're going to have to jump through a hoop. This is a special, you know, unique spell, obviously. And maybe it's part of this, you know, Archdruid circle or whatever. But I like for the, I like for the world to be rich and detailed and for the mechanics and the lore to match as much as possible. For the fluff and the crunch to be as mixed together. I don't like separate layers. I want it all mixed. Like, even when I hard scoop my ice cream, I mix it up until it's soft serve. Anyway, I've always done that. Um, it's just a bit of trivia. <laughs> but, like, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm off on a tangent with it. But I, I, I think that it's... I just I want a better arch. <laughs> and up until now, I'm like, all I'm going to do is, like, toss around wildfire and beat someone that comes anywhere close to me with tree stride up. Because that's the best spell I could have going uh, right now. It gives me the mobility that I need as a, a CR12 creature. I'm just going to you know, concentrate on tree stride while throwing wildfires around. I'm not even going anywhere near change shape, right? I'm not getting the hit point boost from it. It works the exact opposite as, as wild shape for druid PCs. You don't get a big hit point pool. You keep your hit points, your current hit points and their maximum. So the thing that you would use a druid for where you're like, yeah, this druid is just going to keep wild shaping and flying around. And, you know, if it's high enough level, it's just going to cast spells while, while it's a bear or an eagle or something. Good luck. Uh, you know, that's, that's less so um, the case with this arch druid. But the real thing, I could get past the shape change. I could get, I could get past that. But how are you going to be an arch druid without a ninth level spell? That's my big thing here is how I could call someone an arch druid and not have a ninth level spell slot. Because to me, that like the best spell they've got is a fifth level, I think. I think Tree Stride is fifth level. Yeah, yeah, fifth level here. Uh commune with nature, also fifth level there. And mass cure woods. So you got three fifth level spells. Firestorm, Sunbeam, Foresight. Like I expect a, a, an arch druid to be able to light the countryside aflame if they want to. You know, they, I can't summon an elemental. I can't, you know, just snap my fingers and the, you know the beasts of the field appear. I mean, yeah, I can because I want to as a DM. Uh, but I also would like to see something like that. To me, a lot of that is about the spell selection here. This is where spells shine for monsters because it gives them that that little mechanical package that's already written that already has stuff around it. You can modify how they cast spells in, in, with the spell casting action. Do they need material components? Do they need somatic and verbal components? Does it matter? It's not, you know, <laughs> it matters for these. These are still spells, <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, they can't be upcast. Maybe you say they're always, you know, at a, at a certain level, you know, they're already making modifications to these with, with some of the monsters where, you know, even the arch druid can cast commute with nature as an action because they need that in a, in a fight. You got to be able to know what nature's up to, how it feels about the battles going. I just am very sore about the spell casting. Let's be stride, entangle, speak with animals at will. That's entangle, all right. I could see 
that being of, of limited use. Um, but at CR 12, really, but the, the time a party would be facing this, I don't know that it entangles that much of a more than a one round of speed bump. Animal messenger, dominate beast, fairy fire, tree stride. I'd love to dominate the Rachers animal companion uh, or something like that. You know, some of the, there's lots of beasts in a party even would dominate uh, to, to make their lives miserable. <laughs> Mass cure wounds. That, that's a, that's a, you're not going to want to have that go off uh, in the middle of a fight uh, if you're the uh, PCs. So, but tree stride is the big one because of the mobility. And maybe, maybe, I don't think fairy fire. Um, if it were me, I'm definitely putting uh, fog cloud on this list at will. And then probably some high, some heavy hitting big spells once a day, firestorm, sunbeam, things like that. Foresight, love a foresight. Come on. With this AC, with 14 AC, give me a foresight, please. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Compare these to the death locks. This is the, this is the arch druid. It does not feel like an arch druid. I think it does not have the spell selection for it. It's got a great range spell attack. That's great. Wildfire. Good support caster, um, but not a, a centerpiece uh, monster, I think. Um, you know, put, them, put them in a party with a bunch of fey and, and souped up beasts and elementals and uh, watch them you know, blind up to three PCs around. <laughs> uh, fun times. I really like the death locks. I really, really like the death locks. And from all three of them, right? And I think that it shows how the simplification of spellcasting can work for a monster. I'm going to start with just regular deathlock here. CR4. This is CR4 undead, a caster controller-ish type of undead, mid-CR range, so you can get a lot of use out of a monster like this. Uh, you can still, uh, you know, throw a bunch of these into your uh, your tier four encounters and make life miserable for your party uh, with their, you know, 12 to 15 AC and 36 hit points and no special movement. <laughs> but I really like them. They're a good low CR uh, caster bad guy monster, you know, for tier one. And I think tier one always benefits from having interesting and and lethal uh, caster monsters, because you want to capture that feel of D&D, &D, the evil wizard or sorcerer or whatever leading the cult, like death logs easily, easily something like that. Orcus creates these in droves, I bet, you know, <laughs> or Vecna or a Serac or you know, any of the other big uh, undead necromantic uh, cosmic beings in the D&D &D world. Um, so really like I really like this monster because everything I need to run the monster as is right here. It's not complicated, it's not cluttered, and it's pretty pretty clear what the best options from the spell casting trade are and how they will make for an interesting encounter. So I, I like reading stat blocks from the end to the beginning. So just <laughs> deal with it. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's from its for its actions, it's got two attacks, either Deadly Claw or Grave Bolt. Both of these hit hard. Uh, <laughs> this would be a, a nasty monster to have to fight, but it's the ranged attacks here. 120 feet, uh, plus five to hit, 14 average damage, necrotic. And necrotic damage, ways to mitigate, uh, I mean, resist or, or get immunity to that, but still it's going to hit hard at the levels you're encountering it. You couple that with something like Hunger of Hadar to, you know, have a area denial for, uh, <laughs> you know, for parts of the battlefield that the PCs may want to be, like the exit or, or some, you know, location that they have to defend or protect something for. It'd be a really interesting fight. And then before that, they might have interacted with this death lock multiple times through the disguise self spell. And you can just imagine like this gross, withered, cadaverous skeleton that's having like stuff itself full of, you know, <laughs> potpourri and incense and straw, and, you know, to make sure that it doesn't give itself away, that it's actually a walking corpse inhabited by the malevolent will of its former patron, <laughs> because it just looks like a regular person. You know, maybe just maybe you talk to it. It's like that's a weird interaction. Charisma sixteen. They can they can fake it. You know, uh, so you know that's revealed as the illusion drops that that this uh, grotesque creature 
uh, this this undead menace has been with us all along. Oh God! Oh no! <laughs> so anyway, I, I think it's a really fun monster, and like I I, I really think it's an uh, for all three of these, I think it's an improvement over their initial versions in either uh, Dead in Thay or um, Tomo Foes. And I think the simplification of the spell casting works here. I mean, number one, they get more spells they can cast because they're no longer tied to the Warlock class spell, you know, spell casting system. They have thematic spells that complement their roles as ranged damage dealers and battlefield controllers. Like their special movements and, and get out of jail <laughs> powers are located within those spells. But because of concentration, they're, you know, they come with a trade off. There's a risk. At the same time, they have special attacks and attacks that hit hard. Like the Deathlock Mastermind restrains with their, <laughs> with their attack. That's brutal. Uh, so it, you know, it also gets a dimension door spell magic like there's all kinds of stuff that these uh these monsters get that, that complement them as opposed to the druid we look at the arch druid and it's like all right you're clearly a ranged damage dealer here so like maybe some more ranged damage spells maybe you can trade two of my your wildfires for one spell casting something like that uh you know just to be able to mix it up a little bit uh, and so I, I guess I'd like wh whoever, however the deathlock changes uh, went through, I, th I think it just works for the monster and it, in the simplification for it, it, I think is like, this is why, because previously the, I, I overlooked these monsters because they were just, the stat block was too big for the CR. I was like, she's the stat block that big, I, I expect a higher CR, you know, use them in a, in a, a different context. And so these just simplified streamlined. I like them better. Uh, whereas I feel like the arch druid is it, it didn't work uh, for it and, and largely because of spell selection uh so it's uh it's a shame but it's also easy, super easy to change so <laughs> in, in, encouraged in the monster manual no less so um yeah <laughs> uh let's see uh let's let's see what's going on in uh in chat take a couple more questions i want from gary Ooh, what is your favorite demon lord or arch devil in the Monsters of the Multiverse? So I haven't looked at any of the arch devils yet. They just haven't yet. But I've checked out both Demogorgon and Orcus uh, for different reasons. And I was impressed by both of them. Like old Orcus, to me, old Orcus was a chump. <laughs> and when I tried to use him in an adventure, it's just a, a real hassle to use because it's like there's the wand section that does its own thing and then there's the spell casting section and they got the actions and it's just you know this is a tier four fight i want it to be to be smooth on my end i don't want to have to um look at a bunch of stuff when i'm out of, in, in, uh, running a monster at that level because i'm probably running more monsters alongside it and yeah it's a high cr whatever orcus is is one of the more complicated ones because of the ability to summon 500 uh average hit points worth of undead uh, so well i really like them but i i, I orcus but i think i was most impressed by demogorgon demogorgon was one where really, let me pull it up real quick for myself while i'm talking actually i'm not going to type and talk at the same time because i am not uh not that he says as he's talking and typing at the same time um so what i liked about him is this is sort of a unique type of monster the what you might call a melee ranged <laughs> controller you know like uh, most controllers are spellcasters and, and or you know, the equivalent type of monster that attack from range but demogorgon is getting mixed up in things overall i find all the damage for the monsters I've looked at so far to be down, the Deathlock was uh, was one. I was like, oh, those, that looks like <laughs> like it hits really hard. But it seems like the higher CR you get, the more the damage starts to drop off. Uh, I've, I've seen some uh, some breakdowns of monsters of the multiverse for the last few from the last few months from people who've added earlier that, that kind of suggest the same thing. Um, and so that's that sucks. Like to me, I'm I think it probably needs uh, more tentacle attacks. Like. I think two more is not inappropriate uh, and a gaze attack maybe 
you know, this is a, a big demon lord that is, you know, flailing about. You do that, give them more legendary actions, maybe. That, that's another way to uh, to handle this. I don't think it needs, like, new abilities or new attacks. I think it just needs more of what it's got. But Demogorgon is an example of a CR-26 monster. You could just look at it for, for you know, open up the book, click on the link in DD Beyond, look at it, and run it cold. It's about, um, let me see on my book, it's about maybe half a page you know, or three quarters of a page. And that's ideal for me for a monster of this uh, CR. It's got, it's got a, a, an attack that, uh, you know, can cap uh, eight max HP and then some serious crowd control with the gaze. We have, a, you know, your, your choice or a random roll. Uh, I'm definitely gonna be random rolling myself when I run it because you know, it's Demogorgon. Um, between a gaze that stuns, a gaze that confuses with no save, uh, and a gaze that charms and allows Demogorgon to uh, choose how the charmed creature spins its action, reaction, and movement, which I think is really the best way of, of both phrasing that and, um, and sort of like, it's clear that this is just, you're just controlling their actions. Like they're not, um, you know, they're not, uh, you know, controlling their inner life as it were, which for a lot of people, mind control, that's, that's a big, um, it's a big problem. Like you know, you're going to do something with my character that goes against who I see them as, the kind of character they are. Um, I think that's appropriate for a fight with Demogorgon. Demogorgon is nasty. Demogorgon is is a <laughs> you know a, a fine ending to uh, a campaign. But I do think that like a tier four party, especially closer to level twenty, you're going to need some minions with this guy. You're going to need some heavy hitters. Bring in some big brutish demons. Bring in some nasty heavy hitters, uh, Amorites or Garistos or something, Barlgurus, you know, just some really nasty couple, of, you know, maybe a Baylor that, uh, that owes Demogorgon a favor. Two Baylors, come on, get wild with it. Just, you know, bring, bring two of them along with you. So, yeah, I, I really think it's cool. And then there's got some, some fun spellcasting features. I am baffled by all these monsters that have detect magic at will. I really am. I don't know what game the monsters needing to detect magic at will. I've not, I've not been running that game. I've never once been like, man, I wish my monsters could detect magic. If they needed to, they could because they were wizards or something, you know, or dragons or something like that. Um, but like, I, I'm just not sure why all these monsters are detecting magic at will. Major image at will is cool. It would be nice if it specified what level that major image was at. And when I'm running Demogorgon, it's at its max spell. Level. All these spell levels are ninth level um, because major image is one of those that uh, is able to do more things depending on uh, the spell level we cast it out. So, um, third times a day, dispel magic uh, could be good. But I think like the project image is probably my favorite. Uh, I love project image and the kind of thing, the kind of things you can do with it uh, are, are really fun. <laughs> I, you know, it's fun to have. It was like Demogorgon, just like an illusion of Demogorgon just shows up at the tavern at second level and it just you know, says something ominous and abyssal <laughs> and then leaves because it can. <laughs> uh, so okay, project image is, is, I think, probably one of my favorite villain spells because uh, it's like, yeah, we can, we can interact with each other. But you can't touch me. I'm, I'm like 500 miles away. Good luck with your paladin smites and your banishments and your stunning fists. Ah. Good luck. Anyway, Feeble Mind is obviously the big opener. Uh, and so uh, something you should uh, definitely hit the, uh, the healers in the party with. <laughs> All right. And then it's got strong legendary actions. The ability to cast a spell, I think, is essential for any legendary spell casting well, any legendary spellcasting monster. I do not know why Vecna doesn't have it. Yep. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so let's see, Gary, let's, yeah. Yeah, that was your question, Gary. I already answered it. That's, those are my favorites. I'll have to check out some of the, uh, the Arch Devils. All right, Kresko. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but I hope that I did. Uh, <laughs> What would make a good monster for a one-on-one -on -one boss fight with a 15th level Eldritch Knight? One-on-one hmm. -on -one boss fight's going to be tough because, like, the action economy with an Eldritch Knight, you've got action surge, you've got, 
what, not quite four, three attacks, uh, then depending on what kind of Eldritch Knight it is. Like to me, I, if I was doing it, I would just make another PC of some kind and, and someone that, you know, a, uh, <laughs> you know, someone that can take reactions or have their own uh, spell slots, but, or not spell slots, but uh, martial abilities. But now that I'm thinking about it, you might start with a Marlith. Marlith has a lot of attacks. You can take multiple reactions and it is a, a monster that's there to, you know it's a martial monster right if it's sword lady sword snake lady demon yeah. <laughs> and i think that that would probably be where i started but it's not where i would end i, I would soup things up um, perhaps give them another way to mitigate some damage perhaps a little bit of healing or, or some other kind of features that make them a bit tougher or something. But I, I think I would start with the base of Marlith because of the action economy angle. And, you know, if you went legendary, of course, you know, give a lot of cool legendary reaction type abilities that, that would make for an interesting fight. Because I think the other thing that would be essential for this is a monster that forces movement or encourages movement, either by teleporting around the battlefield like if it's a Marlith, definitely do bonus action teleport. None of this action teleport business. Like they're chumps, they're demons for, for uh, the multiverse's sake, um, <laughs> you know. But like, I, I think this is um, if you if you've ever uh, watched or listened to the to early critical role where there's like Grog is a tavern fight with another barbarian, and they're just doing the flat damage from unarmed strike that that everyone that a monk does, and you can see it's like oh this. We got this one one initiative and then didn't miss any of their hits. Like you just, it's the tension to me is a, is sapped from one-on-one -on -one fights because of the nature of hit points and, and D and D combat. So you got to add something else to it. Some sort of movement, uh, mess around with the action economy, break the rules for a one-on-one -on -one fight and, and go nuts with reactions and legendary actions and movements so that it's dynamic and not just, the two of you stay in the same square you, you met each other in and, and whittle each other's hit points away might as well just single roll that <laughs> roll high that's who wins so i'd make it dynamic that's how i would do it good question good question all right let's see here all right here we go <clears throat> krupignat we'll see yeah. there's a lot of different ways to go with that but i chose that one what would be your way to run a, care, a campaign for undead characters? I'm loving this idea. My idea is having PCs be heroes of old brought back to defend the kingdom from existential threats, at least as a start. That's a, that's a wonderful idea. That was, that was one of the things I was thinking of. Yeah, the eternal champions, the returned champions, right? You know, it could be that they're like favored of, of some, you know, god of the underworld or, or, or something like that. You know, goddess of life and death that that brings these champions back and you could structure a whole campaign of like one shots where you save the world <laughs> you know <laughs> that's the other thing about an undead campaign with that setup is it's like okay when we finish this adventure time to go back in your sarcophagus and it's like a hundred years later and so you if you're like down with that style of campaign where you're like time jumping and then it's more episodic you're having these like self-contained adventures where these heroes are brought out and like every time it's it's new groups or or you know, you're, you know, the first time the the NPCs are all very young and then the next danger that you're brought out for is like you know it's like 50 years later and and so that you see how the NPCs change like I think you could get the connections and and role play and, and character development that um, that a lot of people also like along with their monster fighting and and uh, dungeon looting uh, that way that's one way it could be like you know part of a monastic order or something. Um, so do that, or they're like cursed. Yeah, it's just like, you know, you out, you keep coming back. It's like Groundhog Day. And and maybe you play through their first demise or something like that's That's maybe like, a, you know, like a little one shot thing you run as part of a session zero. You know, you're like, yeah, maybe let's play through how you, your characters died. Like you just, you know, I don't know. We, we don't know how it's going to happen, but sometime in the first session, we're going to TPK. Campaign won't be over though. Uh, I would see if they're they're test the waters or something like that. That could be fun. A nice way to start off the campaign is just like, yeah, this is an overwhelming situation. It's okay, but uh, 
you know, <laughs> life will go on. The campaign will go on. Uh, yeah, that, that, you know, undead campaign, you know, they're planar uh, mercenaries or something. Like, there's a lot of reasons why in a D&D world at, at certain levels, like once you hit a certain level, you might look and go, I might just become undead because this is kind of a sweet gig I've got going on. I just don't want to leave it behind. <laughs> I just become undead because it's easier to explore the vastness of the universe if I don't have to worry about breathing and eating and, and all that kind of stuff, needing fresh water to drink. So you could easily do a campaign of like, these are the undead because, you know, they, they did this to themselves voluntarily because they have to go in these toxic, dangerous places to, to fight these, um, these horrors. And, and like, this, this is what they had to do to themselves to, to toughen themselves up to do that. That to become monsters to fight monsters, that could be pretty fun, especially if it's like chaos incursions, you know, from the underworld and and you know, the PCs are the eternal champions of law and order. Um, yeah, that's really cool. I think that's a, that's an interesting campaign frame, and depending on how you run with it or what you do, you could uh, could get a lot of mileage out of some high concept ideas that you just burn through and get out of your system. <laughs> All right, let's see. The Blind Builder Grand Visha. Uh, let's see. What do you think of the new path of the giant barbarian using oversized weapons from something like an Oni when they are large and huge sized? I mean, I, I don't have a strong opinion about it. I think there's probably a reason they didn't give uh, you know the, the, a lot of extra damage based on huge sized uh, for that class. I, like this was one of those things that could hound a third edition game. I remember is classes having ways to increase their size and commiserately the, the web size of their weapon. And to me, it's one of those things where like once or twice, that's cool. Like as a thing that you do, because you've got to wrestle the Tarrasque and get it back in its cage, and, you know, wherever it's supposed to be, you can't hurt it. There's only one of them, you know? <laughs> and so you use like a club or something that's not going to leave a, anything more than a bruise. Um, and it's a big club. This is a giant tree or something. Yeah. You know, like that is interesting. You, you know, you, you, you drank a potion that turns you uh, gargantuan so that you could wield the giant's blade. And it's, you know, embedded in the side of a mountain. And you, know, you have to be this size in order to even try to wield it. And you use it to defeat this you know, world-sized dragon or something like that. And then it's time for it to go back in the mountain. But like as a thing, the character does every fight, every time. I just, to me, I would get bored of it as a DM. I just, oh, more damage you did. All right. Okay. Like it, it, at some point I just, it, I could see it, it undermining the, the the point of playing the game. Like, if it's just inconvenient, how can you always get that big? What if you can't? So I, I like the idea of it for set piece, one time sort of events. I, I, I like it less for something the barbarian does every time they fight, always. Because then I just I'm like, well, I don't know. Maybe we just find a way for you to play a giant. But that's, eh. yeah, yeah. It for me, it's this it's this weird thing where the more it becomes something that's just on or, or regular or constant, um, the more it crosses into my, this is what monsters should be doing. Shtick. This, there, there's a, this is a monster trick. Um, there's just some things like, you know, I don't want any PC to have rust monsters powers. <laughs> that's what rust monsters are for. Uh, you know, liches can come back from the dead because they keep their soul in a receptacle that you have to find it so that's because that's what they do and so there's just some things that i think are monster powers because it's a game and it, it works better that way so that is my very idiosyncratic and uh qualified opinion <laughs> blind builder <laughs> uh let's do one more that i think well, let's take a look at maybe one of the uh one of the fun ones uh that, that people have mentioned in chat i haven't actually been looking at chat i'm looking at, at just the questions um so i'm not sure what the situation is on any monsters to check out. But Gordon asks, I'm thinking of my new campaign, uh, making sorcerers more sorcery by allowing them to spend spell points to attempt to cast any spell, <laughs> cast any spell uh, table to the level of the sorcerer. What are your thoughts? I like the idea if it, 
it comes with like a real drawback like you push yourself and, and something not like irrevocably bad or terrible or like your party's going to ask you to make a new character um that, that, to me that's the big problem with like a wild uh, mage sorcerers really do run the risk of the table going we're tired of being fireballed by you uh, please. So, I, you know, if there's a way narratively to handle it, that'd be cool. Uh, if the player's into it, but I do. I, I've, I've always wished that D and D had a way to model what it sometimes suggested, which was that spell casting is hard. That mages and the like try to cast all kinds of spells, and and you know they they are able to cast only a handful. Uh, you know, depending on on how good they are. And that, like, we're just going to accept that the spell slot system is a way to kind of model that. And you, know, you can cast a limited number because it's taxing. And yeah, you could be a first level and try to cast a third level spell, but it's not going to work. And, and so you're limited to this, this tier of spells, this level of spells. Um, so I've always wanted a way to make uh, D&D spell casting less static. So I like the idea. Uh, to me, a lot of it would, would come down to what's what's the cost involved? Is it interesting? Is it a cost I'm willing to bear uh, because of the benefit? Um, you know, or or is the cost ultimately going to make me go like, well, I'm, I'm never going to really use this option because it's just always going to suck, <laughs> uh, and it's just not going to be worth it. Like it, it needs to be just bad enough to feel like it really like it it means something, but not so bad that the player's like, I'm, I'm not going to use this. And I, unfortunately for me, that's a very idiosyncratic table by table sort of basis. Um, you know, you know, your, your players well. Uh, big thing for that is like, what are you, what are you trying to accomplish at, you know, with those, uh, with the ability to cast from either higher level on the table or, uh, or from other spell slots? Like what's, you know, I said it, you're like, I would to me I, with, with that I would want to like have very thematic spell casters where it's like there's no way I could otherwise have this spell so I'm going to attempt to cast it anyway. Does you get better at casting those spells if you attempt to cast the same one over and over? Well, that, anyway, I like it. I think it's interesting, and certainly this late in the the edition's life cycle, it's time to just go wild with homebrews and experiments, and just if you haven't tried it now, <laughs> go nuts. This time at the end of third edition, I remember we sat down to play once and it was like, everybody just make a 15th level wizard and we'll just go start from there. You can play whatever you want after that, but, but you all have this baseline of 15 levels of wizard uh, to, to play with and let's just start the game. Uh, so I think that's, I think that's, uh, it's time to just play uh, more recklessly, I think. <clears throat> all right, what do we got? So you made perhaps my lovely uh, partner in life and in business uh, could help me out here with this for, for us to look at uh, another monster. Otherwise, I'm just going to scan this real quick, see what you guys like. You can share your screen, man. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can, can't I? You can yes, do I that. Can. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can do that. Um, let's see. I see Zug to me. I see Clockwork. I don't know. What, which was one of the others I was thinking of? Oh, all right. <laughs> I do like the cattle. So I, I, I know that's sort of boring as an option, but I want to go over. I do like that there's a whole entry on cattle, uh, which I think is really, uh, really fun. <laughs> there needs to be more uh, magical bovines in the, uh, in the game there. <laughs> Let's check out Orcus real quick. And then we'll, uh, we'll see. All right. So old Orcus, I did not care for. I thought it was a real jump. New Orcus, I quite like. Uh, the the, uh, <laughs> the simplification here, I, again, I think works, even though there's still uh, some complication. We've got two different ways to cast Undead, it seems. But I'm, I'm thinking like in Master of Undeath, the animate dead that you're casting there is the one from the Wand of Orcus, given that they're both uh, able to cast uh, at will there. Or, Oh, no, wait, now that I'm looking at it, it's not at both at will. One of them is as an action, the other is at will. So he's got two different ways to cast undead. Um, so yeah, and then create undead three times a day. Basically, the this is justification for like, Orcus has as many of these undead as you like, but if you are wanting to create a, a sort of balanced encounter or an encounter that, that's more constrained and predictable, 
then you can just sort of use these const the constraints of these spells as justification for that. And I think that's interesting because that's something the players could research, could look for, you know, like how many of these is, is Orcus able to create a day if he doesn't have his wand with him. Um, so that's, um, I don't know, that's, that's one of those uh, spells uh, and features of uh, spellcasting monsters that I like because it gives the GM an idea of what this monster get up to in a typical day. Orcus just makes a bunch of undead and likes them. Uh, to me, overall, his damage was vastly improved. And the fact that we've got like a strong ranged spell attack is important to me because to me, Orcus is lazy. Orcus sits in his chair. He's not going to get up off his throne. He's not going to make an effort, right? That would be against the point of Orcus. And so like to be able to point the wand and shoot a big blast from it is what I want. I don't, I don't, the beefy Orcus, the, you know, the, the charges in the middle and all that, I, I've never been a big fan of. I much like the slouched on the chair, bored, you know, just hates everything uh, Orcus that, that sort of phones it in with a necronic bolt and just a bunch of undead, like somebody else fight this battle for me. Um, but yeah, we got the Conjure undead once a day. Uh, combined average hit points don't exceed 500. That, that's how many undead you can get. It's like five liches. It's not bad. Um, Death Tyrant, Death Knight, Draco Lich. Those are all fun options for uh, <laughs> for summoning with uh, with this 500 hit point pool you got. Uh, and it really is like, this is where Orcus shines. As Orcus is at the back of a bunch of massive undead creatures. Just you know, undead giants and undead monstrosities and all sorts of horrors pulling out of uh, uh, the bowels of necromancy. And then after all of that, there's this guy who's just been plinking away and summoning monsters and just like making your life miserable uh, from the back. And uh, I think this work is, does it. It's simpler. Uh, it might not be as you know impressive as the Orcus I designed uh, for the Tome of Titans 2C, but that was a different book, um, and that monster is, <laughs> is just a, a different kind of monster. Monsters of the Multiverse Orcus is um, simpler, more streamlined, easier to use, and I think uh, make for a uh, more satisfying fight than uh, as originally printed. Oh, yeah, very cool. Very cool. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed that. I'm not sure what we're going to be doing next week, but we will be doing something uh, here on the live show. And uh, yeah, we might be doing some more Monsters of the Multiverse stuff. Might be diving into something else entirely. We'll have to see. But hope to talk to you then. And until then, have a great week. We'll see you later.